Welcome to another Art Talk at Cedarburg Public Library. This is Laura Beldovs talking with Karen Yank today. And we are talking about her work and also her father's work. Uh, her father, Paul Yank, was a longtime fixture in Cedarburg as an artist himself. And uh, Karen is in town to do a dedication of his sculpture. So, Karen, how about you tell us a little bit about how you how you and your family came to Cedarburg? Oh, thank you for having me, Laura, first of all. And it's kind of a treat that Cedarburg has a radio station now and um, that I would have the honor to, to be interviewed. Um, my family, uh, I, I had four, four of us children, three siblings uh, other than me, and... Um, my mom and dad, uh, Paul and Marion Yank, moved to Cedarburg in 1966 and um, bought the old brewery, the old, it was the uh, Weber Brewery at that time. And um, it's right across the creek behind the uh, winery. Um, so people that don't see as much action there and as in years past remember it. Um, but uh, we moved there, and there had been a fire in that uh, building, and um, so my dad got it, and then he uh, re refurbished the whole interior with old barn woods from uh, hay barns that he uh, took down around the county. And um, so I came out here. I was only five years old, so mm -hmm. I went to school just just over here beyond the library, um, I started in first grade here, and uh, I graduated from Cedarburg High in 79, um, and then went on to follow my art career. Um, I went to Madison uh, to study uh, for my BFA, and then went to Rutgers University for my MFA. Um, but I always like to say that, you know, there's only so much that art school teaches. And the things that I've learned from my dad and the art center um, over all those years is irreplaceable. Yes. So, um, because when you get out of art school, most artists don't know how to make a living, um, mm -hmm. really. They know how to talk about their work and, and to maybe formulate a coherent body of work, but they don't really have the tools they need to succeed. And my dad kind of taught me all of those skills. So I had a jump start on everyone and hence have done really well with my career mm -hmm. already. Um, uh, when we were young here, um, all four of us kids uh, got to take art classes at the Ozaki Art Center um, it, it was first named the, uh, Firehouse Fine Arts Center because it was housed in the old firehouse mm -hmm. that now has been taken over uh, again. Um, uh, my dad and a whole group of artists at that time, it was a large board of like eight artists, um, founded it and refurbished that whole building from the city and, and housed the art center. And then at some point the city really wanted to, the building back and so they moved them over to what is now city hall and so for a while we had the whole city hall which was absolutely the best location because mm -hmm. it has so many floors so we had ceramics in the bottom we had live drawing on the top floors we you know painting in the middle it, it was really outstanding and so I did so much art before I ever even went to high school and then we had a pretty uh, a, a well-established art department at that time at Cedarburg High as well. And so I really got uh, to experiment more. And um, now I'm really pleased with the art department here at uh, Cedarburg. I've worked with a couple of the teachers and uh, met with students and such already um, just on a voluntary basis. But um, so... Dad, dad came here and uh, uh, started working in the brewery and kind of formed this group of artists that may, kind of were the founding members of what Cedarburg is today. Because 
Cedarburg, to, to my knowledge, or what I, I see is they embrace the arts and they embrace the history. And so um, uh, the, um, you know, everything that they did uh, laid the groundwork for what we are now known as one of the most historic towns. And um, my mom and dad both fought to save the winery. They were going to tear that down and put a gas station there. And that was mm -hmm. the first big thing that they success that they got them to save that. And, and then it just, you know, slowly it was one building after another. The Grish Mill was another one that was slated to go and we saved that as well. So, so I feel like, you know, my dad had so much to do with, with the history of Cedarburg, mm -hmm. but then his own history of, as an artist here and how much his growth from when he started to, to when he passed, he passed October 1st of 2020, and it was not COVID-related. Um, he had a cancer that was from an exposure of uh, contaminated water when he was in the military um, and uh, caused bladder cancer that we did not catch until it was in stage four. So no. it was a very short battle. Um, I, I understand your father had a very interesting background in art. He started, um, he went to school at the Leighton School of Art yeah. uh, as a sculptor. And then he later uh, did some work at the Milwaukee Public Museum doing some of the exhibits there. Yeah. And also spent some time abroad in Japan. Yeah. Can, yeah. So. Actually, um, the broad part comes almost first, although the, my mom and dad went back many times after because he formed a lot of relationships in uh, 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 Japan and China. Um, but uh, he studied um, in uh, uh, Kyoto um, during the military. And so not only did he get to study some art, he um, studied bridge building, and um, he used all of those techniques in his big public works, and that's what he passed on to me as well, and I can talk about that a little bit more later. But um, after he uh, left uh, the military, um, my mom and dad started their family in Milwaukee, and he was at Leighton School of Art for his BFA, and uh, a friend of him has said, are you applying for the job, you know, to be the artist in residence at the Milwaukee Museum? And dad said, I didn't even know about it, but I guess I am now. And he's like, shoot, you know, the guy, because he was applying as well. And uh, so dad put in for it and he got it. And he had uh, a couple classes short of graduating uh, from Leighton. Uh, so he was kind of torn, and so they said they would pay for him to go to Milwaukee um, uh, campus and uh, finish his last classes. So he, he has the degree from Leighton, but he also studied at uh, University of Milwaukee. So, um, and then he went and did, um, I think it was like about six, seven-year stint when we were young, um, and he did all the streets of old Milwaukee. Oh, really? Like he did all of that. Oh, wow. And like the African exhibit, all the figures, like this is what he was very good with. He's always been exceptionally good with the human form. Mm -hmm. And so when we were young kids, we got to go with him on set and play in old Milwaukee when it wasn't open to the public. Wow. You know? That's a cool experience. Yeah. So, I mean, uh, we, we were talking about that. My, my brothers and I, um, that we really had a, an amazing upbringing because, mm -hmm. you know, it started like that. Then we moved to this old brewery, which was another host of that building is so um, amazing, and uh, it has all these secret corridors and ways to go down to where the beer was stored and things like that. And so, so we had a lot of fun uh, growing up in that kind of situation. But yeah, so my dad had a a colorful beginning, and before he even 
came to Cedarburg, um, he had met Frank Lloyd Wright and became mm-hmm. very close with him and did some projects with him. And so we had uh, an opportunity to buy one of his spec houses in um, in Bayside. Oh, and wow. And so we gave up that beautiful home to come and buy the brewery. So that was a hard one for my mom, I guess. But uh, And he also knew Calder. And mm-hmm. so he was instrumental in Calder coming. He had had a mobile here at the electric company, if people don't know that. Um, so I got to go to Calder studio as a young, young kid. And um, I really bl- remember it distinctly. And I think it affected, uh, you know, who I am as an artist. Oh, know. sure. Looking at your, your um, public sculptures and also your other works, uh, you know, the shapes, a yeah. lot of Calder's works were of similar shapes. Circular. Yeah. Mm-hmm. A lot of circular. And I'm kind of known for my circular uh, motif. So yeah, so definitely. But um, uh, so your, your father did a lot of sculptural works in the beginning, and then he started working in other types of media. Um, I know he's well known for his mono prints. Um, can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah. Well, when he first came to Cedarburg, he was just primarily doing sculpture. And he did quite a few sh- exhibitions in those days. Um, of of his work and um he started doing public work um his best known one is uh at badger meter and that one really showed his bridge building uh uh, techniques because it's uh, a thousand tons of stainless steel and in the winter when the ice forms on it it was designed so that the ice could form and hold these really beautiful shapes and then it's like 200 tons, you know? Mm-hmm. So, um, and that piece was made when I was a very young girl. And so, you know, 50 years ago. So, um, yeah, that's really interesting in, that he, he made that with that in mind, how the ice will shape onto his work. Yes. He was really into like technical feats back then. And so mm-hmm. his sculptures, uh, most are still around, but, um, uh, then he started to move into what he's b- most well known for is the stained glass uh, method in the wrought iron. And what he does, he he works from the figure primarily. And so he takes like a small pencil rod um, and he slowly uh, draws the figure three dimensionally in space, which is really hard to do. Mm-hmm. And and they are just exquisite. And then he molds the faces with melted steel. So it it's like a ceramics, uh, like a clay model would be where you're dabbing more clay to mm-hmm. make the features. But he's actually melting it and, and controlling it. And he has a series of all these famous artists that he has done. And they're just incredible because they actually look like the artists that that he wanted him to. Um, and then he took and would do elaborate clothing and hair with the stained glass. And he uses the Tiffany style. So, you mm-hmm. know, if you think of a Tiffany style lamp, that very intricate where he would foil both the metal sculpture and then the edge of the glass and then solder both sides. So it's a very lengthy process. So some of his uh, pieces may have taken three years to build. Um, smaller ones, maybe a year, but you have to be re- rotating it at all angles to get the solder to lay flat. And it's just very um, eccentric, I would say. Um, and uh, but but the outcome is really beautiful. So um, the piece that um, well th- that led him then as his body started to age. He just could not do the sculptures anymore. Mm -hmm. And uh, that led him into printmaking. And uh, as luck had it, I married a printmaker. So my husband, Rodney Hammond, he uh, was the education director at the Tamarin Institute in um, Albuquerque, New Mexico, attached with the University of New Mexico um, for 20 years or so. And... uh, um, and they are internationally known 
um, program that trains master printers. And so he would get ha uh, eight students a year, and uh, half would be international, and half would be um, uh, from the United States and uh, from all over. So uh, with that, that kind of inspired Paul. And then um, Rodney helped him get the presses that he needed. And he, we got this huge offset press, and we delivered it from Arizona. You know, I'm in New Mexico, but we mm -hmm. found it in Arizona, and we got it out here. And that opened up like a really big matrix for Paul to work on. Sure. So at the same time as he got that large press... Um, he also had cataract surgery, and it brought all the colors back to light for mm -hmm. him. And he just, it got him so young again, so rejuvenated to have those two things happening at the same time. He just was very prolific. I have so many hundreds of prints of his, all one of a kind. And they're as intricate as the sculptures you know, he almost builds, he builds them like a sculptor. So they're, they're uh, prints that are, are built just like he builds his sculpture, but on the paper. So he'll, he'll lay down some of the background colors and then the line works. And then he, you know, he's filling in the spaces and then he hand renders. And it's just like, it's a very, like my husband says, we have to come up with a new term for it because it's nothing that's ever been done before in printmaking. It's very eccentric again. Dad always kind of pushed things over the top, you know? And um, so he, um, you know, and he, he really enjoyed the printmaking a lot. I think it just really gave him longevity. So he worked up to the, you know, two weeks before he died, he was still in his studio. So um, that's pretty awesome, I think. Now, I, I know that um, your dad has some students that studied under him learning this uh, very um, particular printing method. And yeah. one of them is Jack Petuda, who still does this uh, printmaking style. And I know that Jack will be doing a demonstration at the Cultural Center. Um but uh today yes today thursday may um 20 oh, i can't even think of the date uh it is the 26th and 26th at the cultural center and the receptions from five to seven mm -hmm. and i would think that jack's going to speak around six or six thirty mm -hmm. because um the um we're trying to make it so that the art the art center is having a, a reception as well, and their talk is at five thirty. So we're making so people can do like kind of an art scrawl. Sure. Oh. Okay. So like mm -hmm. start at the one and move to the other. Mm -hmm. So we're hoping at least. Um, and uh, yeah, Jack studied with my dad the longest out of all the students um, for sixteen years. Oh, that's a long time. You know, and mm -hmm. all a lot of the others are you know five seven. You know, it mm -hmm. just depends. Some are only like a half a year or something but mm -hmm. but I have to say that Paul taught so many people over such a long period of time that I have people coming up to me saying I took pottery from Paul I took you know and you know the neat thing about dad he was a kind of a renaissance artist because and any of the artists that were teaching a class if they called in sick or couldn't make it he covered, he could teach anything. Mm -hmm. So he'd teach the jewelry class, he'd teach the ceramics, he would teach, you know. And so um, a lot of times, uh, you know, I would go with him and then I'd just like sit in the class and take that class too. Mm -hmm. And then, uh, so he just, uh, I, I had a, a gal come up to me that took a, a glass, a stained glass class from dad too. So there's so many students. So I'd like to kind of, figure out another show in the future that I might hold at the brewery, you know, through the Ozaki Art Center and showcase a, a diverse group of people that have been coming up to me and talking about their art and what Paul did for them. So um, 
this show in particular is just a handful of artists that were working with him at the very last couple of years, you know. And this is Um, at the Cultural Center, the show? Yeah, the show there. It's just, you know, it's only like uh, eight, not even six artists that uh, worked with Paul at, you know, right before he passed, you know, so it was the, the crew that was there. So it's just a, it's one moment. And, you know, I want to express that just because I don't want people to feel like they were left out mm-hmm. because there's a lot more artists that worked with him and, and had, uh, you know, uh, uh, connection with Paul and might feel, uh, slighted. Um, but, um, there's going to be more opportunities, lots more opportunities for those people to showcase as well. So, Sure. And uh, there's also going to be a dedication that's coming up, too, of your father's sculpture. Yes. Um, uh, my dad, um, we, he was on the, um, on the arts board for the city of Cedarburg um, for years. And uh, they started talking about that, you know, they were collecting pieces from artists that, you know, a strictly donation basis usually. And um, so they were talking to Paul about, we need to have a piece of yours and we should have it right at the Boy Scout Park because it's right by your building. And, you know, and um, so this was kind of in the works before Paul got sick. And uh, it just, so then when we found out he was sick, uh, Miko Hillville and I started to really work seriously and we were thinking we might have it done in time that he would be able to be there. Uh, so I started a fundraiser through the art center, uh, GoFundMe page that people can go to still and, um, and donate. Um, and then some private donors that have given us a bigger check. Uh, I have one, one gal, uh, Joanna Bratt that, really did a huge funding for it had made it possible. So I want to thank her. Mm-hmm. Um, but, uh, uh, that dedication is going to be this next Thursday at five thirty at the Boy Scout park, which is at river edge and Washington street. So this is June 2nd. Yeah. Thursday. June 2nd. And it'll be at five thirty. Um, Paul was also a Marine so it's at the beginning, we're going to have the salute and the taps and they're going to present the flag to, mm-hmm. to my mom, hopefully. And, um, and then, um, after that, we have a line of speakers that are going to speak about Paul, some from the city and some from different museums and, uh, about his, uh, career and who he was as an artist then maybe a few students at that point, and then family. Um, so it'll be really nice, um, kind of a dedication to this particular sculpture, but also kind of a memorial to him as an artist, because when he passed was in the heat of the COVID, so we didn't really get to have that celebration of life that we wanted. So this is kind of our opportunity, so I'm excited to have that kind of happen you know and the the piece is called uh tree of life and i talked with paul a great deal at at the last weeks of his life and we talked about this piece and he said you know karen our life became so attached to the creek when um well he loved the milwaukee river when he was a young boy too he lived close to it in milwaukee and grew up and And uh, the creek, when we moved here, we would snowmobile, we would skate, we would kayak, we would, you know, fish. We, you know, we, us kids swam in it there, even though we weren't supposed to. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Uh, But um, yeah, so we were so connected. And he said the tree line was just always inspirational to him. So he did this abstract tree form. And he, it has little insets on the tops of the branches that uh, create little bird bats. Oh, okay. So hopefully the birds will start to come and and uh, sit in there as, uh, well, yesterday we got a good rain, so maybe I should go check and see if, <laughs> if it's working. Yeah, if they're but, bathing. Yeah, so that's kind of fun. But then... Um, and when do you when was this piece made this tree of life because you mentioned that when he got older he 
wasn't physically able to do sculptures as much anymore. Yeah, I think this was, I'm, you know, roughly dating it on, on 1980. Okay. Um, but uh, he was still pretty good. Um, he probably was still making sculpture up until the 90s. Just the, you know, the end of the, uh, I'm well, no, 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 no. What am I saying? He was making sculpture well on t to the uh, 2010. I would say he still was making smaller sculptures, but mm -hmm. nothing this big. Um, but anyway, I just this is what I'm thinking the dating on that is. And he had done that kind of in a response to um, he had been making a lot of these glass uh, these figurative pieces with the stained glass. And unfortunately, those have to be housed indoors. And uh, so people would come and they want to buy, but they wanted it to be outside. And so, so like he made this piece so that he'd have something for someone outside. And he put it in our backyard and we loved it so much we kept it. And uh, um, so, you know, the city's lucky to have gotten it, I guess. Yeah, because the yeah, I mean, he was so integral in the whole art scene here in mm -hmm. Cedarburg and uh, creating it and establishing it that uh, to have a reminder at Scout Park is going to be a really awesome historical moment for Cedarburg. Yeah, Cedarburg. and the city did a beautiful plaque that will be up in time for the dedication. It's a big plaque and it's Got a little portrait of Paul in there, and it's thanking all the donors. And um, it's really uh, going to mark his life here in, in Cedarburg in a really profound way. So I want to thank them for for going that extra yard for that one. Mm -hmm. So, But um, uh, the thing I want to say, too, is just I'm really my my father's daughter in so many ways. I look like him. I have a gift for gab i <laughs> love to teach and and share with people and so i'm gonna try to step into his shoes a bit but it's gonna be hard to ever fill that but mm -hmm. with my husband as well we can um still continue some of the work that he did and we're hoping to keep the art center going and offer um some different kind of printmaking classes as well. I mean, I, I do understand his process so I can teach it, but uh, we'll offer other methods as well. And we'll try to, we, I'd like to, to become a, a printmaking uh, designation where people from the Milwaukee area will come to study with Rodney and such. And so I think that could be really exciting. But for me, uh, I just have to say that if it wasn't for my background with my dad and how much he cared and he gave to everyone, including me, mm -hmm. um, he would take as much time as he needed with every student. And so when he spent time with me, it was complete. And so uh, when I got out of uh, graduate school and I'm trying to make some kind of living so I can live and make my art, um, I, I, you know, I was ready because he had tooled me on how to do this. So I right away went to galleries and I right away got my work in. And then I started looking at public uh, sculptures because that's really a way for young artists to make larger sums of money. Mm -hmm. And um, from the very first piece that I got, um, I would call him up once I won it. You know, I didn't waste his time on every competition. But um, once I won it, and we would go over it just with a fine tooth comb. And we'd discuss every problem that could arise, every, you know, solution, da, mm -hmm. da, da. And then I'd go at it running and I'd, success, you know, and uh, I've had not one sculpture that has had a problem. And I have over 50 large scale sculptures to date around the whole country. Mm -hmm. And so I owe all that success to my dad. And, yeah, you he's... know, I've, I've found it hard to even apply right now. Once he passed, it's just, it's going to be very emotional for me to do that first one without without his 
you know, with guidance. It was just over the phone a yeah. lot of times because I was in New Mexico, but but priceless. Mm-hmm. Um, and so, you know, I all, all of the people that I, you know, my generation that went through art school always say, gosh, you know, how did you get so successful so quickly? And it's sure. like I tribute to my dad, you know. I'm sure 100%. that... I'm sure his uh, background in the bridge building um, probably had a lot of valuable information because, you know, you have to build bridges that can withstand the pressures and the weather and what else, you know, comes to it. Yeah, and and material usage. Mm -hmm. And yeah, it's like my sculptures are much different looking than his. And, you know, people could go to KarenYank.com and look Mm -hmm. at my work. Or you can go to paulyank.com and look at Paul's work. Sure. But um, uh, um, the inside of my sculptures have all this reinforcement and things that no one knows about and and how you have to put it together so that you can get all those welds inside before you put the skin over the top. Oh, okay. So, so yeah, it's you're always thinking five steps ahead mm-hmm. and... Uh, so it's it's just really been a pleasure. It never was stressful. It was always fun and it was mm-hmm. always um I he never ever would be like tampering down my inspiration. He would always be like even if it's difficult we'll figure out a way to make that work mm-hmm. because you don't want to scale it back because it's too hard or complicated. Sure. So like I was just free to express as much and you know. Yeah. So I also give back to the community in that way. And I love to speak with young artists and trying to encourage them with the public art, because I really think that's one way to um, establish a a good income and get going. And then, Mm -hmm. then at, at a certain point, like I've backed off a bit. Now I only do like one big one a year. I don't do a lot of them Mm -hmm. and um, I'm more interested in my gallery work. So, so you balance it a little bit but um the other issue is that um i know that in wisconsin they don't do this but in a lot of states they have a one percent for the arts uh uh across the board so every structure that's built or regenerated or anything one percent of the money goes to the arts oh really so it generates a huge revenue for art Mm -hmm. in public places Mm -hmm. so um that's where i get most of my commissions through okay yeah i saw the video on your website um how you were installing the uh sculptures in boulder colorado called this show is called currents yes because uh it was the forms that the circle with the crosses and different um types of shapes uh tumbling as you said um uh from one side of the bridge underneath to the other side of the bridge and yeah i thought that was a really um interesting video to watch because oftentimes you don't get to see an artist um artist's work getting installed that way and um and uh could you talk a little bit about that because i uh, you know um i don't know if everyone will be able to see that video but right now yeah. if they're listening they can hear a little bit about yeah how that i'll encourage it, people if they do want to see the video just to go to my website again karenyank.com and then go to uh videos mm-hmm. on the tabs and there's about three or four nice videos of me uh installing different pieces or um you know, telling the story of how the piece came to be and what my motivation was and my Mm -hmm. um, inspiration for the piece and how it served the community in that given site. So this piece in Boulder, Colorado, that you had watched the video, um, uh, they are very um, interested in... um, preservation of land and the environment in Boulder. And so it was an opportunity for me to take a a theme that I've been working on in my gallery work and put it into a public piece. And so Mm -hmm. I use these uh, circles and X's as a 
kind of a show of uh, affection, just like you would say XO on a, a salutation. Uh, um, and um, I make them these big, beautiful sculptures, and then um, I put them out as a beacon for all of us to kind of put our different political and personal issues aside and trying to work for the common good of our our planet and mm -hmm. then f uh, for our you know children that are coming you know so that they have a beautiful world still to live in <laughs> so when you when you uh got that commission did you go to the place to start designing those sculptures or how, how was your process for this well this project? this one is really interesting that you ask because um it was a small budget and i was supposed to just do the bridge railing oh, um, okay. and i was having my exos tumbling across the bridge railing and I met with the task force over and over, and a lot of these were just Zoom visits, um, and we were talking about the whole project. They usually bring the artist in, so you have to, like, understand why was the bridge. It's very circular bridge anyway. It has a huge circular girder. It's got circular um, outlooks, you know, so my work really spoke to the the committee, and um but when they, the committee saw, like, I only got to send in a little proposal, right? Mm -hmm. So they didn't know much about me as an artist. So once they got to know me, they were like, why are we doing a railing? Why aren't we doing a full out sculpture project? Mm -hmm. And I said, funding, I think, you know. Sure. And so then they all said, well, let's talk about that. And so... I told them that because they were building the bridge at the mm -hmm. same time, that there's all these creative ways to budget. Sure. So if they wanted to take over installation, lighting, you know, mm -hmm. insurance costs, things like that, it brings the budget way down for the artist and they, their dollar would get stretched a lot further. Mm -hmm. So with, with me being involved so early on, we were able to do this huge project for a really good budget and so there's 16 pieces mm -hmm. uh, installed. Six are, are big freestanding and, and 10 across that wall that tumbles. And the creek goes through, the Goose Creek goes through there. So it mimics the current of the creek mm -hmm. as well. And so that ended up just being a really fun project, you know, because it was really collaborative from the beginning. I loved how you also spoke about um, how the environment um, influences the patina of the work. And you talked about how uh, the, the level of the snow will leave a mark on the bottom of the sculpture. And, you know, um, after time, you'll see the history of the sculpture. And uh, have you gone to other um, sculptures that you've installed later to see how they've weathered or or how they look now and yeah yeah the um the the one in boulder is unique because it's a it's custom galvanized um steel sculptures so they've been mm -hmm. hot dipped galvanized and and then i patina it i agitate them and i can get this black patina to to darken and it's very stable they're holding up great but what I was talking about is each year, wherever that snow sits, you get just a little bit of the alkaline marking of the water. Mm -hmm. And then the next year, it's a little lower and maybe the drift is over here. So it creates this like water line mm -hmm. on it. And it's just beautiful. And it reminds me of the creek, too. Sure. Yeah. Now, a lot of my work is core 10 and stainless steel. Okay. And core 10 is a steel that was designed for I-beams so that it rusts and then it stops. So it has a rust coating that protects the I-beam from ever deteriorating. Mm -hmm. And so it's much more expensive than mild steel. And some really dry climates I can use steel, but in Wisconsin I definitely have to use core 10. Mm -hmm. And stainless is, of course, totally resistant. So I've combined those two, and I've been able to achieve... A, pretty good variety of colors with them too mm -hmm. and um uh and most of my work is just primarily that um and um 
uh, those do not show like that kind of weathering so much, Mm -hmm. but I have to say I have more sculptures in drier areas than I do. I'm, you know, I'm just now doing my very first project here in uh, Wisconsin. Oh, okay. So it'll be interesting to see how how it turns out and how the weather. Yes, influences it's it. what's what's fun about this one is they contacted me because of the things going on here in Cedarburg. Sure. They heard about me, mm-hmm. and uh, and so they found me, and I competed against some other artists here, and uh, they selected my piece, but. Um, it was inspired, um, their eye surgeons, and it's for this big eye surgery clinic in West Dallas. And um, uh, I was inspired by the story I told you about my dad's cataract surgery. Yeah. And so I made uh, my circular image, mm-hmm. and it's the eyeball. Oh. And, and, and you can see it's, it's really quite lovely. And, and then mm-hmm. it has some rays of stained glass coming out to show the color spectrum. Mm-hmm. And so anyway, so it really spoke to them and, and it was kind of a treat for me to tell my dad's story. And it sounds like uh, maybe his knowledge of bridge building also helped you figure out the materials that you would need because you were telling me about these different types of steels. Steel well, metals. yes, because my dad told me, you know, at the very beginning, don't do anything that needs maintenance because no matter how much they love it at the beginning and they say they'll maintain it, they won't. Mm-hmm. And they're good people, that, but they won't. And I said, oh, come on, you know. And so my very first project, I did, I got second place. I didn't win it. It was for the University of New Mexico Hospital. Mm-hmm. And I had uh, a very large project uh, proposed and another gal got it. And, um, and they called me and said, you got second. And I was like, well, that's like getting second in a beauty pageant. It doesn't matter. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> and and they said, no, but this time it does, because we would like to commission you outright for just the sculpture on the left side of your proposal. And I said, oh, OK. And so they said we came up with funds and da, da, da. Mm-hmm. And it was kind of still low budget. And so I said, that's really not enough t- to do it in core 10 and stainless, but I could probably do it in you know, steel and this and that, but then you'd have to coat it. Mm -hmm. And they said they would. And I went against my dad's thoughts and I did it. Mm -hmm. And they never coated it. And uh, it's the only piece I have out there, you Mm -hmm. know, but the good end, good end to the story is that they contacted me once I started building a bigger career and reputation. Sure. And they said, could we pay you to refurbish it and do it the way you wanted and put this core and stainless in there? And then so it wouldn't have to be coated. So they came up, they paid me more to refurbish it than oh. the first, uh, how much I got when I designed it. Mm-hmm. And so... Um, and now that one's all fixed. So now I have no pieces out there that are deteriorating anywhere. <laughs> so I'm very happy. Sure. Um, I did a big piece for the community college in Albuquerque, um, which is really a big uh, community college. It's not a small, it's like a university. And it really has a very active uh, role in the community there. And so mm-hmm. many walks of life people study for different careers. Mm-hmm. And um, I did this huge piece for them, and it was for their 100th year anniversary, and they wanted to to have this big celebration with this piece. And so we went and had the talk and the dedication, and, and I said to them, you know, sad, but, you know, it, it's going to be fine in t- another 100 years. It's going to look exactly the same, sure. and we won't be here, but, mm-hmm. you know, they'll have it still, so... You know, um, mm-hmm. that's the kind of fun, fun stuff. I I did a very large bridge project for the state of New Mexico that goes over all the interstate. Mm-hmm. And um, that one, uh, you know, uh, they have to replace the bridge every 40 years. And my sculptures are going to have to be moved over and over and over oh. because they'll last forever. Sure, yeah. So, um, yeah, so we were... 
uh, you know, talking about that. That's a, a project that I never, it was my first really huge project. Mm -hmm. And I did it, I started it in 04 mm -hmm. and it didn't even get finished completely until like 07. And, um, I, uh, didn't have the foresight to video like, uh, or to make a video or, um, anything at that time, which now I do with all my projects. Mm -hmm. Um, so, but I have all this great footage of, we had to shut the whole interstate down and crane it up at night because it was cheaper to shut the interstate at night. Mm -hmm. And so it looked like a movie set. It was oh, really? really quite inciting, you know, and then lifting it hundreds of feet up in the air and putting mm -hmm. it on these bridge outsides. And, um, so that, that was, uh, something that I, you know, when you were talking about that, I all of a sudden got the inspiration. I'm going to go back and make that video now and tell that story still. Sure. Cause that was a fun one, um, for me, because I worked with a public committee that they put together. And so they, they were my client and the public. And so I went to them with my designs and we made changes and, th you know, I listened to their input. Mm -hmm. And so I made sure everyone liked it by the time we were ready to make it or fabricate it. Mm -hmm. And so that was really fun. So I had this whole group that came up when it was being installed and, you know, kind of like said, yeah, we did good, you know, as a, as a team. And uh, I have so many funny stories about that project. So that would be a fun one to, you know, talk it was about so more. involved. Yeah, mm -hmm. it was so involved. There were lots of, you know, there's uh, nothing ever goes completely smooth. And so you have to learn how to kind of roll with the punches and sure. make changes on the spot and do what you have to do. And so that one has a lot of fun stories. But um, yeah, in the video, you were showing how during the installation, uh, moving your pieces, sometimes they got a little scratch and you were showing how how you were able to sand it off and apply the patina yeah. again to, um, and that's just par for the course, you know, yeah. that, that sometimes happens, but, but. You know, that, that piece, that same boulder piece, what a trip that was because I had it done a year prior and they didn't have the bridge done and they didn't have the bridge done. So finally I couldn't store them anymore. Like mm -hmm. I had to get more work going. And so they stored them. And they stored them inside, which was lovely. And but then <laughs> the guys that were moving into the site decided, well, wouldn't it be good if we load them the night before so we can be on the site? Like, right, you know. So they wrapped them in all these blankets mm -hmm. and then um, left it outside and it rained. Oh. And so the blankets messed up the black because it's oh, like really? you're everything's a chemical reaction so sure. that water just sitting so i had to sand literally a lot of the surfaces back and redo them okay and i had like a terrible cold i don't know yeah you could tell in my voice i was very hoarse and it's like as luck has it i have a temperature i'm out there yeah and, and there's nothing i can do about it i just gotta do it so yeah. it's just like i just <laughs> you know and um but the piece looks fantastic I, mm -hmm. it's probably the piece that i get the most uh text from like people okay um um, you know, even people I don't know will find mm -hmm. m me on my website and send me a picture of them with it. Oh, and cool. And it's very funny, mm -hmm. but I get lots and lots. And so it, it just looks fabulous. The mm -hmm. surfaces did great. Uh, so all my um, extra efforts were paid off, you know, sure. <laughs> in a good way. The, th the other thing I would want to say is um, I am... Uh, working with my dad's estate totally. Mm -hmm. um, like uh, the family decided that I was the only one that really had the background or education to. So we put it in a trust and I'm the one to contact if people want to see his work, buy his work, museums, uh, all of that. And so I've been meeting with a lot of the museums here okay. in um, Wisconsin and and I'm actually talking about branching it out to, and, and to other places as well. But... Um, there's some interest in having a show of my dad's and mine together oh, at cool. um, various museums. So 
Stay tuned. I'll come back and tell you if I get those things to happen. Sure. And if I if it, if I do get that show here in Wisconsin, the museum in Albuquerque, New Mexico wants to travel it down there as well. So, so I could bring Paul then to to, to my neighborhood, you know, and mm-hmm. that would be really great. Um, so, um, the uh, years ago, um, I must have been. Maybe about 30 years ago, I think, uh, my dad and I got the Laird Award here in Wisconsin for Laird Award in the Arts. And it was just such a treat for us both to go and be honored together. And we both mm-hmm. had to do public talks. And, sure. you know, and I, and I could tell, you know, there was one thing my dad was very, very um, proud of his work you know, and he was always willing to show it to anyone and talk about it and share. But the one thing I think he was most proud of was me and really touching, you know, because everyone that I'm meeting and I'm saying, well, you know, talking about my dad's work, they'll say, well, do you know that your dad told me this and this and this and this, you know? And so like I was his, his, I think he felt like I went further than he could and and you know that's his legacy in me and so he was more proud of me than sure. you know his own work which is really so I think that had it's too bad we didn't have all this uh energy going for uh, a two-person show when he was alive because he would have really enjoyed it um so so I'm hoping it happens. <laughs> sure. Yeah. So, uh, so then we have a dedication this um, upcoming Thursday, June second, at five thirty at the Cub Scout Park in Cedarburg, to dedicate Paul Yank and his legacy here in Cedarburg. And then Karen will look forward to hearing from you about a, a a double show with your work and your father's work in the future. Yeah, and I'll also keep you um, posted when the art center really starts up classes again so that the community can start Great. interacting with us in that lovely building. Great. Well, thank you for uh, stopping by today to, ta- to talk with us. Um, we are so happy to learn about your work and your father's legacy, and we look forward to seeing more of that here in Cedarburg. Thank you so much, Laura. So this has been another Art Talk at CPL Radio. Thanks for listening.